How's everybody doing? Everybody doing okay? Isn't that awesome to worship God in that way and to sing to him? Thank you so much for being here this morning. I will catch you up if you're a visitor. So we, are, we started the New Year's off in a series that was called Selfless. And so as we get ready for baptismal here, we adjusted some of the messages so that we could bring the one that was most relevant to being a disciple of Jesus. And we all know what Jesus says in the Bible about being selfless. The first thing, one of his commandments is to deny yourself, take up your, and follow. Yeah, that's, that's Jesus says that. And so if we're going to do that, we're going to study a little bit in depth of what that means. The very first Sunday, the series of the series, the message was being bold in witness and how Jesus commands us to make disciples, go out and make disciples. It's all part of being what Jennifer and Eldon and Marnita want to do here this morning. They're going to become disciples. They already are, but we're going to show it by symbolization of baptism. So that that is uh Part of that, and we, we trust that doing that, making a stand and a bold testimony in front of each and every one of you guys is, is going to empower them and inspire them to do that. Being bold in witness, it was, uh, and then after that, it was extravagant generosity and how Jesus teaches us to give, give without holding back, and how that is awesome to be around people that give and don't hold back. And so we trust that uh, as you are a visitor here this morning, that the people from our church were listening on that Sunday and they give you great hospitality and a great welcome. If not, you can raise your hand and we'll make sure you get that. All right. So that's you're caught up now with the series. It's called Selfless, Not Selfish. And we know you guys know you live in a community or not in, not really this community, but our culture around us is all about self promotion, self promotion. And if you Google self promotion, it is incredible. The page after page after page of everyone knows how to self promote. Right. I see, I, and I, I have to laugh because, not laugh, but I, I, I find it humorous uh, because we're all trying, I, I fall into that very same category as being a business owner. I want to promote my store. My store is the best furniture store in Holmes County. There's a free plug for you. Hopefully they'll edit that out. But that, that's, right? We, we have the best. We self-promote. We are taught how to self-promote. If you don't know how, you can Google it. There are tons and tons of articles out there. Everybody has 10 ways to self-promote, seven ways that are foolproof, all, all sorts of things. And that is what the culture that we live in. That's the culture that we live in. And I'm going to ask you a simple question this morning. and something that I want you to take away from here. When... You die when you take your last breath on earth the way that Dean and Stevie did. What is the action that they will classify you as with the word always? Jimmy was always. Becky was always. Eldon was always. Dean was always. He was the life of the party, wasn't he? He's was always upbeat. Stevie was just like him. There was never a dull moment in the dugout with Stevie. Right? Stevie was always talking. Stevie was always happy. Stevie was always smiling. Those are the things that we will remember them by. My question to you is, what will we remember you by always? He was always giving. He was always kind. He was always griping. He was always on his phone. He was always working about that one. None of us do that. Always finding fault. You know what I want? I want people to say, Jimmy always shared his faith. He was always talking about God. That's the kind of witness that I want to leave. But it doesn't matter. 
as we live our life, when we come to the end of it, they will know us by something that we did always. And the one thing that we want to talk about this morning is serving. Can they always say we were serving? And as you guys get ready to join the discipleship, the, 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 the hood of disciples, the, the number one thing that Christ asks us to do in the core of Christianity is to be a servant. It's not to serve. It's just to plain be a servant. It's serving is not what an action that we do. It's who we are. As Christians, it's who we are. And so as, as we are inundated with the culture of self-promotion and self-gratification and self-centeredness, you guys know, you, you're on social media. I know you know what I'm talking about. And that's, how about, if you ask, they did a study on teens, and they asked them what their most uh, desired career is. Do you know what they said? 54% of them said they just don't care what it is. They want to be famous. They want to be famous. So they want to be the greatest of all time. How many know what a goat is? Yeah, it stands for what? The greatest of all time, right? And so many people, we, we label, we, we know athletes that are labeled that way. We know Hollywood stars that are labeled that way. They're just called the GOAT. I can't believe it, but that's what they call them. And it's, it's just, it stands for the greatest of all time. Is that self-promoting? Is that self-indulgent? Is that, how is that? Is that selfish or is that selfless? And I will tell you, if you want to be, the problem with that is, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, his teaching is completely opposite of that. It doesn't have any room for that. And this is what Jesus said. If you want to follow me, you must promote yourself. I'm just seeing if y'all are listening. No, he says, deny yourself, pick up your cross, die to yourself. That's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to symbolize that by dying to self and follow me. If you want to be great, then don't self-promote. Matthew chapter 23, verse 11, it says this, that the greatest among you will be your servant. If you're a follower of Christ, you're not called to live a selfish life or a self-centered life, but instead he calls us to invites us to be selfless, denying ourselves, uh, taking on the very nature of a servant. In other words, as Jesus followers, serving is not something we do it is reflects who we are. Repeat after me, I'm, and maybe you don't want to, but I'm going to ask that you do. I am a servant of the Most High God, and when I serve others, I'm serving Christ. How many believe that this morning? Let's say it again. I am a servant of the Most High God. When I serve others, I'm serving Christ. Christ. Serving isn't just what we do. Serving, like being a servant is who we are. And so I'll ask you this all throughout this message. What is it that you were always doing? Can people say at the end of your life that he was always helping? He was always serving. He was always the first one there. He was always ready to help. Acts chapter 9, verse 36, it says this. This is from scripture. It says this, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha in Greek, her name is Dorcas, and she was always doing good and helping the poor. Tabitha was one that what she did to help the poor was to sew clothes and to sew warm blankets and things to give away, and she would do that. And the Bible says she was always doing that. And so you sit here this morning and you say, okay, Jimmy, well, how do I become such a faithful servant? You might say, I can't talk like you do, or I can't play music like Josh does, or I can't do the things that the, my neighbor does, or I'm not good at that. What can I do to be a faithful servant? And today, I will promise you, we're going to keep it very, very simple. We're not going to get complicated here this morning. I want these three, there, there's a lot of emotions going around, Eldon and, and Marnita and Jennifer right now. There's a lot of uh, nerves probably, am I right? So we're going to keep it simple for their sake because I want them to walk out of here. And more than that, I want all of us to be able to walk out of here with something to take with us. And so I'm going to use three images from Scripture that follow very simple stories, okay? And I hope that it will inspire you and, and be memorable to you uh, and, and cause you to want to become 
a faithful servant. So the number one thing that we can do, just everybody here can do, is bring a lunch. All right? Everybody can do that. And everybody can offer a ride. And everybody can bring a towel or carry a towel. And we'll get into the story here in a minute of those three. We'll start with bringing a lunch. And I know the first thing that you're going to think is where Jesus fed the 5,000, but let me back up from there. When you think of King David, what do you think of? The first thing that comes to your mind when you think of David is that he killed who? Goliath, right? He killed the biggest giant in the land, the biggest, meanest man on the land. And that's how we start as a young child. We start vision envisioning David as being that he was a great war hero. But how did he become a great war hero? There was something that he did before that that set him up and gave him the stage to be that war hero that day. And this is how this is how it was. King David would go. They would go out and fight. And when they would come back, all the women and the children would sit on top of the walls and they would sing. And that's how Saul got so angry. Remember how Saul plotted to kill David because the women started to sing. They were like, Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his ten thousands. And so the women, their, their wives and all the kids would sit on the walls and sing as they would come home from war. Now, one of these days I expect Becky, after I get done preaching, to sit somewhere and sing to me. <laughs> Might be today. Beck, you into that? So that was, what, that was what would happen. The women would sit on the wall and they would praise the men coming home. And so David was a war hero, and we think of it that way. But where did it start? Where did it start? We know him for his greatness and how he won the battle. But what about when it, where it says in 1 Samuel 17, this was before, this was just moments before he entered into that valley. Becky and I actually got to see that valley while we were in Israel uh, back in 17. We got to see that valley. And just moments before he walked in there, this is what, Je uh, this is what the Bible says. First Samuel chapter 17, it says, One day Jesse, which was David's dad, said to David, Take this basket of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. Where were his brothers? They were over in the valley. They were fighting the Philistines. There was a big time battle going on and David was just a young man. He would, doesn't say exactly how old he was. We think 15, 16, 17 at the most. And Jesse says, hey, all of your brothers are over there fighting. I need you to make sure that they're nourished and that they have something to eat. So here, take this over to them. And David, yeah, I'll go, sure. And in verse 18, it says, see how your brothers are getting along. And bring back a report on how they are doing. Hey, David. So you want to fight in the battle? Bring a lunch. That's all he did. He was just being obedient in the very smallest of gestures. And when he gets there, you guys know the rest of the story. There was this big time talking back and forth of the Philistine, the big giant Goliath. He was there and he was like, hey. None of you can come up against me. And Dave's standing there with his lunch. He's like, hey, hold this a minute. I got it. And they're like, no, you can't do that. He's like, yeah, I got this. Right? But it started with being a servant. He served a lunch. So when you think might be insignificant and the things that are the gifts that you have in your life, you might think you're out of the spotlight or in the backgrounds or behind the scenes. And that's fine. Because the kingdom of God is made up of those small, small things. And the way that we're promoted in the kingdom of God, it's never by self-promotion. Not at all. It's always by serving. You want to be great? Is that our goal? What do you do? You serve. You bring a lunch. Number two, you offer a ride. <clears throat> and all of us can do that. Doesn't matter what type of vehicle we have, we can offer a ride, right? So 553 years before this happened, this was prophesied. The, pro the prophet Zechariah had prophesied that this would happen. And you have to know the setting. Jesus, they were getting ready to have the Passover. And this was like on Thursday night before Good Friday and before 
the crucifixion. So this was on Thursday night. And the, from the prophecy that Zechariah had stated, all of the Israelites thought that the king that was coming, the Jews thought that the king that was coming would be on a white horse with a flowing robe and a gold crown. That's, I mean, it would be significant. The same way we would think a caravan of stretched limousine and, and all of the paparazzi that follows in our day to day, right? Not some moped. So if you could think of it as equivalent to that of Trump coming riding on a, on a moped, can you imagine that? That's not what we would think of our, as our president or our leader. And that was the same way then. Our culture thinks the same way they did. They thought that he would come in in this awesome, glamorous way. And here he's, Jesus is telling his disciples, this is on Thursday night, there's the, the, the night before Passover, and he goes, hey, I'm going to need you guys to go downtown. I'm going to have to get you to secure me a donkey. I need a donkey to ride into Jerusalem. And they were like, well, what, what if we, I mean, we don't know anybody in town. He said, well, just go down there, and this is what I want you to do. See, he knew that prophecy was being fulfilled. And in Luke chapter 19, verse 31, it says this. If, any asks, if anyone asks you, this is Jesus telling his disciples, why are you untying it, the donkey? Why are you taking our donkey? And you just say, the Lord needs it. And so how do we become a faithful servant? We offer a ride because the Lord needs it. And you know what's cool about this story and what, I, what stands out to me about this story is this businessman we don't know his name. The Bible doesn't know. It doesn't tell us what his name is. It doesn't tell us how many donkeys he owned. Now, we know Becky and I rode donkeys over there while we were there. Do we have video of that? I'm kidding, Beck. We do have video of that, but you've got to pay me to see it. Becky was on a, on a donkey. She listened to rap music out in the middle. Okay, so uh, it's pretty cool, actually. But we know while we were over there, donkeys are like a commodity because... I, we only had one donkey in our little clan. There was, I had to walk while she rode the donkey. And so I would have paid, by the time half the day was up, I would have paid any kind of money to see another donkey, right? I'd have probably kissed the stupid thing because I was tired. It was back in around mountains. It was unbelievable. It was an incredible journey that we took. My point is this. We know that in that culture and in that society, if they had donkeys, they had money. So this man had money. He had some kind of business. We don't know what, it was, what he had, but he had wealth of some kind because he had donkeys. And he just, what we do know, though, is that he simply said, yeah, take it. If the Lord needs it, take it. So how do we, how do we become faithful servants? We offer rides. What was cool about that one, that one there, the donkey had no miles on it. It was brand new. It had never been ridden. And so if someone came to us and asked us for our vehicle, would we say, well, yeah, you can have that one, but not this one. This is our new one, right? Same thing. He gave him a brand new donkey. Why did he do that? Because he knew that he was a servant of the Most High God. Do you know that? Do we understand that we are servants of the Most High God? What interests me the most about all of that is 2,000 years later, we're still talking about that ride. We're still talking about that ride into Jerusalem. We talk about it every spring on Palm Sunday. So how can you make a difference as a servant? You can bring a lunch. You can offer a ride. And the number three way is you can carry a towel. One of the most powerful pictures in the New Testament is that night on Thursday night. They were meeting in the secret room, up, up in the upper room, the Bible says. And Jesus knew he was about to give his life. And here's... What was happening there after they were eating supper, they were starting to argue, and an argument broke out about who was the greatest. Now, can you imagine Jesus sitting there knowing what's coming to him, and his disciples are over here saying, 
Well, I'm the greatest. John, of course, was the first one to say, I would imagine, because when you read in Scripture, John always refers to himself as the one who Jesus loves. You imagine that? If you had a buddy who was close to Jesus and you were just as close and he would always say, yeah, but I'm the one that Jesus loves. And he refers to himself a lot in Scripture as the one who Jesus loved. You know there was a little bit of tension there when Peter said, yeah, okay, you might be the one that Jesus loved, but at least I'm the one that got out of the boat and tried to walk on the water. And Bartholomew was over there, hey, what about me? And they're like, what? We didn't even know you were a disciple. Right? And so that type of argument was going on around the table and they were... They were trying to figure out who was the goat, the greatest of all time. And Jesus said, he's sitting at the table. He said, guys, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve, and I came to give my life. In John 13, this is what Jesus did. In verse 4, says this. So Jesus got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing and he wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. You got to know the context of this story. It's not just bending down and washing somebody's feet. We do that in symbolization at our communion time still today as an act of selfless servanthood for one another. But what was Interesting, the way that we do that today is when someone comes in, we say, can we take your coat, right? We offer them a drink maybe, but (laughs) but it it gets pretty serious when we, if they came to our house and we're like, hey, first thing we want to do is wash your feet, right? That's just not what we do. We don't do that. And so, but back in that day, they would because of how they walked with open sandals. They walked in the hot desert sun and dusty, and their feet were always in need of being washed. And so they would always offer a foot washing when they came to there. But, however, the host himself would never do it. See, it was something that only the servants would do. And so for Jesus to bend down and get up, and come over and bend down and say, I'm going to wash you guys' feet. It was totally unorthodox. It was unacceptable. Peter raised a fit. You guys know the story there. He said, no, you can't do this. And when Jesus got done explaining it all to him, he says, well, don't just wash my feet. Wash everything, right? And here is Jesus, the Son of God, the living water, track with me, the Lamb of God, the true vine, Bread of life, light of the world, living stone, the king of glory, prince of peace, the righteous judge, light of the world, the chosen one, the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end, our redeemer, our sanctification and our righteousness. He gets up and says, let me, let me do it. It's the greatest of all time. Jesus, but I'll do it because I want to set an example for you guys and all of you. Stop arguing about who's the greatest (laughs) that's not in the kingdom. Here, I'll wash your feet. He carried a towel. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. This was one when I became a pastor. I, uh, I met an individual at the post office in Berlin, and this was the verse that he gave to me. He said, Jimmy, he used... He's a retired pastor, and he said, I need you to read this, and I need you to study it. This, is, this should be your life verse, and it has become my life verse. It says this, for even the Son of Man, Jesus saying it, it's written in red, came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so many times we get hung up on, well, I'll serve here, or I'll do that, just so people get off of my back, right? But he came to give his life as a ransom for many. If you want to be a selfless servant, a great servant, then it takes sacrifice. He knew that the greatest among us would never be self-promoted, but always a servant. So we bring a lunch, we offer a ride, and we carry a towel because serving is not something that we do. It's who we are. And when we serve others, We're serving Christ. Say it with me again. I am a servant of the Most High God. 
And when I serve others, I'm serving Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says this. If you read that, it says that all the nations will gather. And from there, he will separate the sheep from the goats. And you're going to say, well, but Jesus, I, I, never, I never knew that I did this. And he says, but when, you, when I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was locked out, you invited me in. When I was sick, you prayed for me. When I was in prison, you visited me. What you do to the least of these, what you did to the least of these, you did to me. Maybe you hold a baby. Sarah's going to Africa. She, that's her passion. Maybe we feed homeless. We've got a bunch of us going over to uh, New York City starting on Tuesday. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time and commission to all of us that are going over there. Maybe we do some things like that. But maybe, maybe we just greet people with a smile. Maybe we open our home in hospitality. I know Becky and I, our family, our mission statement at home is to show people love and the glory of God through our hospitality at our home. Maybe you just welcome a stranger. Maybe you read to a kid. See, it's those little things that add up to being kingdom principles of serving. Maybe you cook a dinner, give a coat. Anybody can bring a lunch, offer a ride, and carry a towel. And what will we hear when we get to the end of our lives? I want to hear Jesus saying, you know what? Well done, my good and faithful servant. And I trust that's what you want to hear. I want to hear the part of servant. Serving isn't what we do. It's who we are. Denying ourselves. Taking up a cross and following him. Matthew chapter 23, verse 11. We'll put it up there again. The greatest among you will be your servant. 